So, we're live. Um, so what this is, is a bit of an experiment. I have an exhibition in Bateman Street in Soho in London, and it is a series of, in fact, it was, it's kind of a series, but it, in a way it's actually not supposed to be a series. I think it was supposed to be a really small space with just one can of my own urine in the space. And, um, and then I thought, oh, well, that's a, it's a perfect opportunity. Seeing this now, it's a show. It's also a perfect opportunity to try and expand, uh, in a way, the thinking, to try and expand and think about what on earth is going on and how, how I got to where I got to, but also more like where we might be going. And um, so it's called, this is, this is called a discussion, uh, collecting the uncollectible and the state of art now. Um, we're still, I think we're still waiting for everybody to join. So all that preamble was just a preamble. Um, and uh, I, I did it really on purpose because what will happen is that um, when this gets put back out on, on, online, that bit will come in. And, uh, and normally what happens with these things is that I, um, I kind of, I go like that and I stare <laughs> at the screen and wait until some people have come in the room and I wait and then I recognise someone, I go, oh, hey, like that. And it was always a bit strange at the beginning. So I didn't do that. Well, oh no, I just did that. I just did all that stuff. You could anyway. have that stuff. Um, really like so it. I've got um, Kate Brandt with me here in the, in the show and I've got Victor Wind there in Suffolk in his studio and um, so we have talked about what we're going to talk about and, and I've said that I don't know what it is that we're going to talk about, I just want to know what you're going to talk about, well not you but them um, and, and we kind of thought that we should talk a little bit about the work but then I was quite coy and thought oh, I don't really want to talk about it too much um, maybe we can talk about other things, but I think that there's definitely something to, there's definitely something necessary to discuss, which is about this sense of the abject, about this idea of the lockdown, about this idea of kind of key, it's a sort of Freudian thing, it's sort of anal thing, this, this idea of of kind of saving everything, not being able to let go or letting go. So, so what is what is going on? We're we're now in a in a in a, a kind of um, we're in a climate where we worry about our waste. We worry about what we what we leave behind or or what we make in a way. Like how do we make things? How do we keep things or not keep things? What what kind of mess are we kind of getting ourselves into? Um, and uh, and then also like like where's art at? Um, you know how how can art have any kind of? Um, and I think it is it's weirdly enough it's a kind of materiality question because I still um, I mean I, I get asked a lot about this idea of the NFT and um, and I I think that one of the things that one of the things that doesn't or isn't quite working for me yet is this idea of the physicality of it. And maybe it's just because I haven't really quite got in touch with owning something on a screen and how something can be owned on a screen. And whether that's okay, whether, whether having that thing on screen has, <laughs> enough kind of, um, has enough kind of physicality to it and whether that's okay, whether that works for me. But um, so... I wasn't going to do a lot of talking, I was going to quickly move it over because otherwise everyone's just sitting kind of like patiently going, we're just going to shut up. Um, but uh, if I first, I, first of all I'm actually going to ask Victor a question, um, which is when, when I first uh, heard of your, your uh, project in Hackney, you talked about it as you wanted to open a shop which stopped things or had things in it which no one wanted to buy. Um, <laughs> so homage to what happened? 
Yeah, what happened? Speak a little bit about this. It, that, what happened with that idea was it, 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 well, it was the sort of homage to Reginald Perrin's prop shop. Um, I was more into theatre, I think, theatre projects then. But uh, so they, I just had this idea of making a fake shop full of really crap, rubbish, fake things. Um, but then I discovered that you could get a lot of these wonderful things. And I, I met various people who got enthusiastic and said, look, um, you can have, take some of mine, you can borrow some. Like there was a medical prop company and they said, you can just help yourself, you can borrow whatever you want. So we got all these autopsy tables, medical cabinets. Um, James Birch very kindly said that you had all these sort of water potter things. Um, and then I made friends with this guy called Robbo, but this had closed his curiosity shop and you know, sitting there, went down to see him in a council estate in, or just outside London somewhere, and he came there and there were five trampled heads sitting, sitting next to the kitchen. This is mum's house, and we went up into the attic and started opening boxes and all sorts of human skulls and the mummified erect penis of a hanged man. And, Bit of two headed piglets and god knows what else came out, and, so, and then I, I got um, seduced by the idea that you could go around and buy you know, babies and bottles and things like that, and um, whoopee, really. <laughs> and, and the objects that, that you collect, like how, in a way, like how would you kind of classify them? Because I, I kind of I, earlier on, like, I was thinking that they were like artifacts. I called them artifacts, but that maybe is wrong. And I think that sometimes, like, and I think that part of what you're doing is creating stories. Uh, and a lot of the, the objects are about the curation and about the, the, the in a way, like the titling. I think there's a, there's a lot of attention to detail on the way that you title the works. How, how does that? Well, in, the, in, the, in my museum, I don't see them as individual objects. They're, they're part of a, it's, it's a, it's a collage or it's a picture. You know, the, the objects are my tubes of paint. Um, and then I arrange them and, it, and it's the way they, they talk to each other, both in the museum and they talk to people who, who come. Mm. I mean, so, so you start seeing the whole museum as a kind, it, it almost as a kind of work. One, it's almost like one thing. Yeah, it's a Gesundheitskunstwerk. Yeah, okay, good. Um, <laughs> and and it's uh, full of piss. And, <laughs> and there is quite a few piss things in there, yeah, and I want to kind of, I do want to get back to that. Um, so, Kate, when, uh, when I asked you about whether you wanted to do this thing, I think in my mind I was thinking, well, you know, Kate's going to be brilliant because she's out there, like looking at artists, looking at art, seeing things, what's going on. Like throughout the whole pandemic, you're, I see you face pop up and, uh, and you, know, you do a beautiful job of being able to make, in a way, like make this complicated business of art, like with, with intentionality and with, with a, um, I think with attention to detail and, and also knowledge as well, that make it kind of digestible, make it, make it kind of, Go, make it work. And um, but I also know that you're a fan of Duchamp, mm. and uh, and I was in an exhibition you curated um, some years ago now at Finance Society, which was a homage to Duchamp. Yeah. And uh, and that really kind of I think that was a an amazing, in a way, it was an amazing testament to this idea that 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 we still can't I think art historically maybe and maybe we maybe this whole kind of like pandemic now process is moving us out of it but i think we're still locked into that um fountain and obviously this relates to the fact that that sort of fountain moment um so maybe i don't know if there, was, there wasn't a question in there but. <laughs> there's lots to unpick but i think i wanted to do that exhibition it was called what marcel duchamp taught me because i thought well if marcel duchamp is the most influential artist when he was voted of the 20th century I think people would argue that Picasso is the greatest artist of the 20th century, but Duchamp was the most influential. If he really is the most influential artist, then I wanted to know, like, from 50 of my favourite artists working in London, what did he teach you? And I was kind of quite specific about asking, if he's influential, then I wonder what door you went through as a consequence. And I was looking back at that show recently, and it 
struck me as something you've touched upon. The show, even though we all think about Duchamp being quite conceptual, that show was very much about material. Mm -hmm. Like it was, there was a lot of process in that show. It was a lot of materiality. And what you touched on earlier about NFTs is interesting because I think a lot of um, that kind of 1990s conversation about what's happening in London and the birth of a whole new period of art history, super exciting, often difficult for people to understand at the beginning, was the idea that all of the art was an idea. And that missed the point because actually, you know, Damon, I remember very quickly said, I don't really consider myself a conceptual artist. I make things. Like I care about the making of things. Otherwise, and so I'm interested in that idea that we still really care about objects and the physicality of things. But what's so fascinating about this exhibition is it's through the lens of a very different world in which actually physical objects almost have to justify their existence in a world totally overloaded with things. So I don't know if art's ever been asked to justify its existence on kind of moral grounds before. And I think that's happening now. You can go to Bar's art program, and you see a massive sculpture and you think, is that good for the environment mm. to make that and then mm. to send that around the world? And it's almost like art's being asked a new question, which is a kind of almost a moral question, mm. not about the, the subject matter of art, but about like, are you allowed to make new stuff? Because mm. we're all thinking about stuff and waste. Mm. Um, so this just seemed like, as always with Gavin Crack and Perfect exhibition, to talk about the moment that we're in. I mean, it, it, I think it attempts to raise that question up and, and, and it is about the, the physical thing, but also the physical thing and hidden thing, you know, and it is sort of, it's about what you can't see as yeah. much as what you can see. It's about that sort of Schrodinger's cat kind of, it, you know, it's in the box, it's alive, it's dead, it's alive, it's dead. And, and it, it's almost like that resonance, and I think that idea of something switching off, off and on, is something that, I mean, if we do come back to Duchamp, like, I think that, that with his work, one of the reasons why it doesn't quite go away, or you can't quite put it out, is that it's just reson it sort of resonates, whether that's through language, whether, whether that's through, through uh, the, in a way, the, the, almost like the surreal kind of quality of the actual materials of it. It's like, oh my God, why is it actually that? How did that happen? How did it turn out in that way? And then also there's mysteries. Mm -hmm. Like there's the locked door, there's the, there's the, there's the, he didn't have, you know, like I, I think that Tini Duchamp was like, was, was pretending that he wasn't where he was and he had a secret studio. He created work without, you know, like some, some of his works apparently are made with his own semen. Yeah. Apparently the, the fountain work was put, was put forward by someone else. Uh, uh, and you know, so there's all these mysteries and, and weird codes and, and sort of odd kind of you know, odd parts to the work, which are really off the material element. They're really they're really sort of bits of storytelling, but they they kind of keep the whole um, they keep a, a, a kind of um, yeah. I think the word resonance is really important because it, it, it it's it's just a a kind of did it or isn't it? it? Is it not or is it? I mean, this, in a way, it seems to me like this this notion of that's not art um, is part of art. Like art is like it fluctuates between that this is art, this is not art, this is art, this is not art. I think on some on some sort of like really hard edge. I mean, this is you know there's an element to this which is really derivative. Um, it's very sort of second. It's a very sort of second class citizen. But it's very sort of self-aware of its second-class citizen citizenness. Well, I would, argue, I would argue that art history is part of its medium, surely, because it is. Yeah. It's not a, you're not like it, it's not a casual reference. No. I mean, it's, it's almost an interrogation of the, that art, that idea, sure. that argument. I mean, they can't exist without what Pierre Manzoni did in sure. 1961. Sure. And it, it, and, it, and those sorts of things are quite odd as well for me because obviously it. It, it has sort of like clung, it has been around me in this, what's been around me? <laughs> what's been around me is this sense of people asking me, like, do I need to know the references in order to enjoy or experience the work? And I'm always kind of, I'm a little bit like, well, I think you're able to enjoy and experience the work even if you don't know what the references are. Or that I think the references I, I choose or make are, are so kind of, so ingrained 
within a more generalised like idea of art yeah. that that you might know them even though I mean it may be that you that you go oh I don't get I recognise that I don't get it so you're you're almost like too close to recognising that you don't get it so you, you get disturbed and go I really don't get it because I recognise I don't get it and therefore I really don't get it um, but but generally speaking it, it might just be that that you don't need to know actually the references or you know if you do start to find out about them, that might just be an enjoyable, uh, an enjoyable journey. It might just be a, a nice thing to, to come to think about. Um, with, the, with the objects in, in your uh, museum, Victor, um, lots of them, you, you might not know what they are. They, they don't necessarily say what they are straightforwardly. I, mean, I think probably, I would say 50% of the objects in your museum um, don't they don't disclose what they are straightforwardly, and I think that there's that like ultimately it becomes very mysterious um, as to how they work. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, I suppose when I when I open the museum, um, I hate labels in museums. I think they're really annoying. Um, so when I open my museum, I I thought I wouldn't put labels on anything, um, and I thought. That the audience could write their own, you know, script to go with it. But um, and then I, I decided actually after I went to the Museum of Wit Magic and Witchcraft in Bowcastle that on the face of it you go in there and there's these cabinets full of really not uh, not very interesting things. But it's the labels that's interesting, um, and people are lost. So I then I, I start up putting lots and lots of labels on things, and I don't think that necessarily helps you to understand probably what the objects are, but it, it helps me to turn it more into a, you know, create a narrative that, that you can go down. So it's a sort of a, you know, it's a three-dimensional novel in many ways. Um, yeah, I mean, I was thinking very much of, I mean, what's st stuck in my head is the, um, is that fur ball that you have, um, that, that is this amazing, really beautifully tight-knit grey ball which so looks so, which looks so, like, sorry, it looks so man-made, so specifically created, but it's sort of, it's actually like a hairball from a cat, is it from a cow? Yeah, it's a hairball from a cow's stomach, it's one right. of my, you know, it's one of my favourite things in the, I in mean, the whole it, world, and it, it gives me such joy. And, 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 the, and the nice thing about this as well is that obviously it's a really lowly, sort of, it's a really lowly thing, it's, a, it's, a, it's just an extraordinary like fine, it's like a find if you like, and I think that's this idea of the objet, objet trouvé, the finding something, and, and like coming across something, like the idea of touffé, like again, if we come back to Duchamp, this idea of finding things, uh, or finding relationship to things in, in the world. Well I have it next but, now to my, to a baked potato, but I, I think, you know, I left it in the Argo overnight and forgot about it and it's, and it's just the husk of the baked potato and it's it's really beautiful. Yeah. Well I, I think I do I, I think um, I have seen like a friend's mum's collection of things that have been burned <laughs> the, the collection of the, the its various incinerations from an Arga. I think Argas are particularly good at, uh, at at you forget and then they create these wonderful uh, coal like lumps, these black, special black lumps. Of, this is interesting because uh, it's about where you place the, the value because what's so fascinating about Manzoni built into the DNA of this like uncollectible thing was, was commodification. Mm. The fact that he sold it for the weight of gold. Mm. So it's like the artist shit sold at the weight of gold and mm. that these are works made through you know Kickstarter. So the mm. idea is that it's a it's a, a funding mechanism which is mm. part of the performance. Mm. And so the baked potato doesn't necessarily have any, no uh, disrespect intended, but any commercial value beyond the passion which oh, you have. I saw one at auction. Oh, right, okay, here it is. Here it is. Well, okay. Well, well, I, okay, okay, great, thank you. Because, but I'm, so I'm glad to hear that. But I want to use that sort of baked, to use the term, into the DNA of mm. the. Manzoni and the, this work, mm. I gather, is the idea of the value of the market and the role that the market plays in art. Like, can 
cannot exist without the art market, which obviously Duchamp was really interested in as well. Um, you know, we're not wanting, you know, wanting to try and sell air, but rather give it away. Mm. And he, you know, so I think that's sort of, it's interesting, particularly now as well, to talk about art in a way that we, we find it very difficult to talk about art without talking about money now. And you mm. think about like 1950s New York, these guys never sold anything, they didn't want to talk about money. You couldn't have a conversation in the Cedar Tavern with the abstract expressionists and, and hope to talk about money. Mm. Whereas, and I'm not saying artists sit around talking about money now, but it's just very difficult to talk about art and not mention the market or money at all, or commodification, or any of those systems of play. I mean, I think on an audience level, it's definitely a thing that, that, that moves the art over into a place where people go, oh, well, wow, it must be good because it's such a value. Yeah. Um, like, you know, there's, there's some pound signs connected to it. And, and value, it's really interesting, this conversation about value, because I think the whole conversation is based on this idea of value. I use the word waste, I also use this word value. And value, like, and how value is, is created is so interesting in relation whether it's financial value, for like like whether it's whether it's cultural value, mm. whether it's intellectual value, like like how how you know or, or certain like certain power relations. Um, I mean, it, for for me doing this project it was really fascinating to to take it. I mean, when I had the opening last night, I was saying to someone, "Oh, this is my first exhibition," and they were like, "What do you mean?" I was like, "Well, it's an exhibition that I've organised and I've got my work in it." And, and essentially, I'm not, I'm not working with a gallery as such. What happened was that I, I, I made a Kickstarter campaign and then, and then that generated the money to publish the, publish the artwork and also to put on an exhibition. So in a funny sort of way, it's gone, it's gone in a different, it's a very different kind of process. And I, I also do think that that has got something to do with now and the process of now. Uh, and, and to do possibly with the pandemic and being locked down and, and almost like things returning, stuff returning on itself. Uh, you know, I've, I've actually, like on a, on a kind of um, creative level, found it incredibly profound, um, this notion of, and if we want to come back to the idea of materiality, but the notion of, of not being able to get out, not being able to see exhibitions. And I think that there is a, there's a big cultural vacuum now. I mean, people aren't seeing exhibitions in the way they were seeing exhibitions before. Um, you know, a lot of stuff is being read on and seen online. Yeah. The majority. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what does, where have I taken, where have I taken this conversation to now? Um, I mean, how, do, how have you found the museum working in, in relationship to the, I mean, obviously you, you've had to deal with uh, not being able to be open and stuff. Was the disaster? Disaster, yeah. They only funded through people coming and paying for tickets. Um, and can't open the door, can't have any money coming in. Yeah. I, I mean, so, but you've been doing lots of work online. Well, last year was a disaster. This year has been fine because I, I made my lecture program online and that has proved very popular. Okay. So that's good. So basically, it's just a case of finding different avenues. And, and in a way, I guess, I guess that's. Kind of, it's something of what I'm sort of talking about here as well. Um, but I, what I'm interested in is if you, well, I haven't worked out the answer, but it strikes me that when, when I first knew what Manzoni did, mm. the gold, mm. it seemed like a provocation, mm. and it seemed like the people that were part of it had to sort of somehow agree to some sort of tacit agreement that it was like Emperor's New Clothes. And they almost had to either get the joke or not get the joke, mm. but money was involved and commerce was involved and values involved from day one. Mm. And with your work now, right now, it seems to have flipped it on its side because the work didn't exist until you had the audience. Mm. So you almost had people's buy-in, so it didn't feel like the same emperor. That's why it was so intense. But maybe, it didn't feel the same emperor's new. Did, did, but maybe it was. I mean, maybe it was really similar. Maybe it was actually really similar. Double, double it, maybe it was really similar. It's not, it is, it is as much as I, I kind of provoked and said I was going to do this. Yeah. Um, do you want me to do it? If, yeah. you, if you do, then, then you know, enough people say yes, then I'll do it. Well, yeah. obviously, I was going to sort of do it anyway. Yeah, we, we knew I mean, that. Things, we know you. I mean, yeah. one of the things I, I mean, where it, where it started as well was I was um, originally planning to sell enough cans of my own pits to buy one of the Manzoni tins. 
Um, because I had this idea that if you owned a tin, that like that essentially meant that you could open. That was the most minimal art museum. Like like it, it, it affiliated me to the a system of of, uh, of art museums, and uh, so I could show the the the, 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 uh, the Manzoni shit. And, it, and actually, like, I, but suddenly the, the, the Didn't place... Didn't you also like to the, the alchemical process of turning piss into shit? Yes, yeah. there, there's something of that as well. That's, that's, that's <laughs> enjoyable, yeah. the alchemy of the artist, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and so, the, so the first line of thing was I was going to sell enough piss to buy the shit. Um, and that was where I went to with Kickstarter, and they said, "Well, basically, you can't, you can't sell, you can't just make money to buy something. What you have to do is you have to check." So, in a way, it was the process itself that, that twisted it round and made it into, "I want to publish this thing." And so, literally, if you, if if we can raise enough money, we'll publish it. So, yeah. it, it was almost like because Kickstarter itself is a, is a, it, it has to make things. Mm. Um, so. Yeah. Which comes back to that materiality thing, that you could, so therefore, could you, can you do a Kickstarter for NFTs? I guess you could do. Yeah, because you say you would publish it. I guess you could do. Yeah. You could, you could do, saying, yeah, I don't, I don't know, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. It's an interesting one because you, because in so many ways you virtually have to do it. You have to, I have to kind of show the can and everything and have what you're getting, like when you're, saying, I've got to publish it. So you have to make sort of prototypes and, and it has to be quite realistic, otherwise people don't necessarily get it. So mm. it's quite a funny process. Because you almost made it. I mean, it's a bit, it's a bit like getting an Arts Council award. Like, by the time the money comes, you've already, you know, you've already spent it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's too late to stop, you know, it's too late to stop the process. Also, if it doesn't come, it's like, oh my God, now I'm going into this program without, without enough money. And one of the questions I wanted to know is to what extent you think people would be shocked by this still? Like, for example, for you, Victor, as well, when you talk about works that you've collected which are urine, or that there are things which are urine-based, or any of this, do you think there still has that capacity to shock, given where we've got to in art? I mean, I, I know many people that hate my little imitation Piero Manzoni that I have right. at the moment. Like, they infuriate them. Like, every time they see it, they know they're not over it. It just makes them so cross. And I, I'm surprised by that. Are they getting infuriated by... They were getting infuriated just literally by having to deal with the idea. Yeah. They just, they just, the idea the idea, idea every single time you just clap them in the face. Right. I think it's very hard to... Shock. I mean, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not very interested in shocking people. No. I've been reading quite a lot about Isidore Azou this year. I mean, his whole career was based around, you know, being as provocative and shocking as possible. Um, and that it was very easy in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s to to shock people. Um, but it depends where you are. I mean, I remember when I was painting my toenails in Italy in the late 90s, early 90s. And people with old women in the supermarket would literally drop their bags when they looked at my from look from my painted toenails up. But I mean, I, I don't think in, I think by the time someone's come through the door into my museum, um, <laughs> then I'm not really going to shock them. Mm. But it is quite shocking stuff. I mean, there is potentially quite incendiary stuff there. I mean, you know, you, it does really. Um, but isn't that in the context? It would be um, shocking if you went into, I don't know, you know, a supermarket and you saw it, but you, you come into a, what well, it used yeah. to be called the Little Shop of Horrors, and now it's a museum of unnatural history. It would be it's shocking if it, if it didn't have. Mm. So that's context, isn't it? Because here we've just got people just walking, you know, busy Friday night in Soho, people just walking past, mm. and as we were getting ready to go, there's a couple of guys out there, and they were really like, struck by the windows right. and, and smiling as well because there's the word piss naturally yeah. you smile because you think it's funny or because it makes you slightly uncomfortable you just have yeah. a nervous smile yeah. um, I mean, it, it, there's it, something it, about this being physically <laughs> here in Soho that's unexpected probably for some people you don't have that, what I mean is it's not the same the walking in context yeah I mean and also like it is odd as well because there's lots of little 
alleyways around here and certainly the one just behind here, which always smells of piss as well. <laughs> um, because people do come out here and they're in Soho, they get drunk and then they pee on the wall around yeah. the corner. So there's a kind of vague smell of urine. In oh, Soho. I used to work. Um, yeah, it's 100%. So, so that 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 so it's quite it makes quite an interesting backdrop. But like the, the word piss is quite interesting because obviously it does come from man's only using the word shit yeah. rather than excrement. And and so there's a, there's something to do with this colloquialism, which is quite interesting. And I and that was that was something that I've really kind of I pushed hard again with with all the translations um, of artist piss into different languages, thirty mm -hmm. different languages. And, and really try to go back to the forwards, back to the forwards with translators and say, but is this, is this, you know, the colloquial, I mean, some languages don't even have it. It has to be the artist's urine. Well, I they to, don't have a... I tried to think earlier on what you would even say in America. Would you, you wouldn't say piss in America, would you? Or would you? Because I, I know you haven't translated it to America. I think but you it's would say piss. Do you think it's a, is there anyone American watching? Would you say piss? But um, <laughs> I was just thinking about that. I was like, I wonder if this translates even in English speaking. Yeah. Well, I have to, I'm sorry, I, I, that's caught me out. No, no, but it, it shouldn't be, but it's about the, and also that's the Duchamp thing as well, I'm so interested in, in language as a... Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so I'll sure. look it And then all the different languages, you know, in, in some ways, it, it's quite interesting because it, it starts to talk about the fact that the, the, the product is a kind of a global product mm -hmm. and the art itself is now more of a kind of a global, so, so in a way like all the different languages are the top, they're, they're all the languages of the sort of, the, the, the top 30 languages spoken in, mm. in, in places where they might buy contemporary art. Yeah. <laughs> um, but also it's more Holian because the artist shit, is, I mean it's the can, it was probably a can of its time. That resonance is lost with me now because it doesn't look like a can, it looks to me now. Mm -hmm. It's a particularity mm -hmm. or it's, it's, it's Italian nature or whatever. Well, it's a tin. Well, it's a tin. It's a tin. Yeah, whereas now. So it's, it's a tin because it's solid. Yeah. And this is a can because it's liquid. But when you walk past <laughs> in the street, this really does look like it could be. It's so beautifully branded mm. that it looks like it could be this a pop up for a new fizzy drink. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like and this is. It's a cool new fizzy drink from Korea. I mean, and they do have. It feels very more holy. And they do have. They do, in this place it is a place which is used for pop-ups, mm. and so they do have. Uh, it, it could well be. I, I, feel, I feel like I've seen it in yeah. the shop. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, like, like a pop-up pop yeah. uh, can, fizzy drink can, uh, yeah. thing. So it, it definitely, it's definitely again like playing with its um, with its kind of ghosts on lots of levels. Like it's ghosts like on the high street, or it's ghosts in art history, or it's ghosts in. <coughs> In lots of different places, I think yeah. there's there's a lot of kinds of. Um, I mean, it, it's also it, it's interesting because it, it, it for me it does feel very punk and out there and quite hard, and then at the same time, like it has so many kind of like dissenting and and, and soft kind of edges to it and kind of points where it it um, it it doesn't quite work. And I, but I think that you see, you can see it mm. not quite working. I don't know. Oh, for me. I mean, okay. as an art historian, I'm getting too bogged down. No, but as an art historian, I love coming to your work because you, you, because you give me so much because I, your idea is always like, ah, oh, okay, that's, that's such a genius gallant idea to exist in its own space. But as someone who loves art history, yeah. I'm really excited because it's like a pinball machine and I get to ricochet around lots of different ideas, which I find fascinating, that I can never solve. Right. Like, and actually, sometimes you just yeah. go deeper and deeper into these art historical problems of authorship, ownership, the artist as the alchemist, value, commodification, yeah. all of these things kind of just swirl around. Good. And I kind of think, well, I'm getting closer to the answer, and I realise, no, it just got more difficult. <laughs> well, I think that's what art's a bit like that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to art college because I, I was interested in art, but I thought I wanted to, to understand what I liked and didn't like. And um, I think, you know, well, what, obviously what happened was I still don't know what I like and don't like, straightforwardly. Um, just the process of, of not knowing what I like and don't like has just got more complicated. Um, but much more interesting as well. Mm. Um, so, where are we going now? So, get going. Are you How just, you time you're not going to buy yourself a, a tin of shit then? Well, yeah, I, 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 think if, I think, well, I think if... if uh, the, the problem is that the cans... 
Um, and I have done, I am doing very well with sending the cans, but I've got a feeling that there is a, it's an addition of a thousand. Wow. Okay. So, well, and the idea is that they're 250 pounds each, which is roughly the price of silver for the can. Yeah. And, um, and the idea was that, that with a thousand at 250, that gives me 250,000 pounds. So I can buy the, just the shit. But the trouble is, it's costing me money and to just stay alive. And this is what I'm doing. So I'm ending up spending the money as fast as I'm making it. So, I mean, I could probably take a mortgage out, but you know, then I'm gonna take, have to take another mortgage out to get the, uh, to get the thing. I mean, I don't know. I mean, there may be a way that we can negotiate a can. So, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not hundred percent saying that it's not going to happen. I'm keeping, I'm keeping my options open in relationship to getting a can. Um, I also know that there are lots of fake cans as well, and I think this is, I think this is really fascinating and interesting because I'm not sure whether I'm totally against the idea of getting a fake can, actually, which is odd. I mean, fakeness is a really kind of, again, a really important thing. Something not being something. And I spend a lot of my time not being something. In fact, my Instagram is, this is not Gavin Turk. And it's, and it's because kind of, in a way, it's not Gavin Turk. It's, it's an Instagram account of, of made by the studio, made by me sometimes, made by anyone who, who kind of like comes up with an image and puts it online and I go, oh, that's good. Or someone else goes, what about this? I go, oh yeah, that's good, put that on. And so, you know, it gets a construct in a way, or what is Gavin Turk, you know? And, and I think that, again, with art, a lot of art, and when I think about art, it, it's quite often this idea of, of something not being real, which might, it might give, get you closer to what is real, that you might be able to get closer to what's real by what's not real than, than, some, than, than some other process. So this idea of the fake and the, and the um, you know, something that's, something that's obviously not that thing. I mean, I did a whole series of works of me, like, not, it was, it was me dressed up as Andy Warhol. And in many ways, like, the, the, the prints were, were about, this is not Warhol, yeah. rather than this is Gavin Turk. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a sort of, it was a strange, uh, going backwards at the problem, yeah, approaching the problem. Yeah, and it's backwards. just about the, 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 my Pierre Manzoni is definitely a fake, it's a proper, it's an addition. Yes. So that's what's interesting about it, that it's, 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 as, it's as irritating as if I own the real one. Yeah, well, I, I, have, have, I actually have one, of, I actually yeah. have two of those yeah, ones yeah, as well. Yeah, and I, I do have one in the toilet in my house, um, but, I do, but I do feel quite not, I don't feel very excited about it. It's, no, a, it's I, not, it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't really excite me to be timeline. Yeah, because you uh, know it's not the... I don't know. But when it has, it, my strange. friend is particularly annoyed about my one. If she came over and it was the real one, and right. I said that's worth calling her really own cat. Right, that'd be even worse. I don't think I'd be able to change her mind, I think it would become worse. Right. So, but then it's also about like what, who gives what value, which is obviously what's so interesting about what Victor's practice is about, is like do you place value on these things and the value system is so nuanced that it's like you as the you know the conductor of these things which are so fabulous and fascinating to you but are uh, overlooked by other people and so if you can if you can that's like almost more fascinating then it's like a double 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 block if you buy the fake one on purpose yeah yeah <laughs> but yeah i mean it uh, yeah there's just something there's definitely something about the kind of, and again, if we come back to where we started, which was this materiality thing, mm -hmm. like the idea of a fake as being, as it dematerializes almost, like it's, if it's fake, it's dematerialized, but in actual fact, it, it, it doesn't, it's actually still there. And it's still, in many ways, it still is. I mean, if it's a really good fake, it actually, to all intents and purposes, you can't tell the difference between this and another. Yeah. I mean, it, there, was a, there was a story that um, Francis Morris at the Tate was saying when they reopened the tanks downstairs at the Tate, they put a Robert Morris sculpture, which is four mirrored cubes. Um, Robert Morris untitled 1965 to 72. They put these mirrored cubes in, in, the, um, in the tanks building and she said, we're really excited to have these works here and we can have them to the public and get insurance for them because these are actual, because this is a replica. So I was thinking like, 
This is a replica of four mirrored cubes, and the real one is still in the storage. Is that, how does that work? Yeah. And actually, lots of work in museums, I find, out, are actually replicas. Well, the fountain by Duchamp is not the fountain by Duchamp. It's an addition made after the fact. Sure. Because the original is gone. So, but, so, but he ascribed that value. I don't know. And, and did he, he put, he, he, he marked it. They he painted it. They were made in his lifetime. Yeah. Actually, somebody else's idea. But, yeah, but also, like with Duchamp as well, like he, he came, he, he had kind of had that Renaissance period, yeah. like when Rauschenberg and Johnson and various mm -hmm. like, like artists in New York mm -hmm. like kind of picked him up. Yeah, he sort of retired from yeah. art and yeah. he was a chess player. Yeah. Um, and then, then all those artists absolutely sort of yeah. gave him the second win. But actually, and he tried to make out that he wasn't an artist, and then when he died, we realised he was, he'd been yeah. making this work. Yeah. So even just resisting that title of artist. But he also was kind of responsible for putting together the room. Like the William Cope, he put together the yeah. whole. He, he he constructed all of the the people in the Philadelphia Museum. He he made he kind of he kind of got them all there together and got the money and mm -hmm. kind of got them to buy his work and yeah. put it where it was. Where it put it where it went. Yes, yeah. he'd been the, asked, he'd which was called asked. which was called given. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So anyway, yes. Sorry, we, we digressed on to Marcel Duchamp. Do, do you have any Duchamp stories, Victor? No. Not at all, no. Uh -huh. <laughs> He's resisting a Duchampian answer, just like Duchamp would resist that. Yes. Um, and so, with the museum and looking forwards, how, what, where do you see it going? Or, I mean, I, I know that you've been doing touring shows. You did a show in Cornwall. I've got a show up at the National Maritime Museum in Falmouth, which is uh, Falmouth, yeah, um, which is up to the end of, end of next year. Um, I don't know where it's going. I mean, I, it's, I, I, it's always amazing because it was only supposed to be there for six months, so it always amazes me that it's that, it, that it's still there. I mean, I, I got very excited this year because I thought it was full, and then I noticed they were stuffing on the ceiling. Um, so we've been busy filling the the ceiling with things, and that, that's almost done, so I, I suspect I've got to work out how to put things on the floor. How to put things on the floor? Well, yeah. just, I, I've, I've been uh, obviously getting a blow-by-blow -blow, um, view of the things on the ceiling, because there are these wonderful emu eggs and ostrich eggs, like, cut, cut and then put, placed up on the ceiling. Some with the holes, some without the holes, where they've been uh, drained or not drained, and they're all just now floating like this kind of m amazing um, sort of sea of strange. What what do they remind? What do they remind me of? What do they remind you of? Depends where they are, because they're quite. I think, there's a lot more since you've been there. I know. And they're, they're also they're, they're they're surrounded by the entomological displays, and in, in some ways they look like you know, the rather disturbing eggs of some. Um, giant creep, giant insect that yeah. stayed in the top. But the, you know, I think, I mean, eggs are just sort of beautiful, aren't they? Well, you in made some eggs. Yeah, I've made over, I've made probably over 700 works with eggs. Mm. So, yeah, I, I, I got kind of stuck with the egg, yeah. Yeah, it, I, I kind of, I, I think for a moment I was trying to look into the idea of, of, of just thinking of form and whether that form could, whether you could kind of, almost like, get, make it a signature. And, and it isn't like some artists like have a signature in, in material form, yeah. like so Joseph Boyce, if you see a sort of lump of fat, you kind of go, oh, Joseph Boyce. Yeah. Um, but quiet. somehow, uh, yeah. yeah, you see a blue hat yeah. and you go, oh, I can be hat. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, so artists kind of almost like, get a signature on certain things in the world and I mean you know I people send me pictures in the middle of the night people send me pictures of black bags uh, of black bin liners <laughs> outside their hat with, with rain on them and stuff like oh I saw this and thought of you this is oh this is all that is for a beauty you know it's like bing you're like oh I can't, well, I can't sleep what's that oh someone's just sent me a picture of a bin bag brilliant um so yeah so anyway I, I thought it would be pictures of eggs but no it's pictures of bin bags um, <laughs> so we've got now 15 minutes and we're going to do um, a Q&A thing and, and uh, there is a Q&A box on the screen here, it's far away from me, so 
I might have to go right up to the screen or... I you can need to read it out, Kevin, because I'm, I'm sitting right in front of it. Do it, then make clear, yeah. No, I, I can't read it, so I don't know what the question is. And do you want me to read the question? Yes, that would be good, yeah. Okay, Charles Brown is saying, Hi Gavin, what about performance art in its purest sense, i.e. in the moment, at the time of the happening, not a record of the performance? I have attended performance events which have seared into my memory and which I will take to the grave. These have had a major impact on my engagement with and have, ch and have challenged my perceptions of art and the impact of art. As a collector, these have in some ways been as impactful as the owned artefact. I mean, yeah, it's a, it, I don't quite know what, what the question is in there, but, but in terms of the performance, I think that there is obviously a performance going on here. Um, there's, a, there's a performative element to, to being an artist. Um, like, quite often when you look at an artwork, when you look at a painting, you, you, you might think, oh, what's it like in the studio? What, how does it... How is that painting done? Where does it where does it kind of come from? What's the source of this? Um, and it does quite often draw the audience back to, and it's part of that philosophical dialogue that the audience has with the with the artwork, because in order to understand the artwork, they might start to have to have a philosophical dialogue with the artist, and and in that and part of that pro, that dialogue would would incorporate the, I suppose, the performance of actually making the art in the first place, or showing the art and how the, how the art shows. Um, the, the, the notion of performance, obviously, is, is, is and that the idea of happening um, is, is pretty fantastic and is quite kind of, um, I'm not, I don't want to say cult-like, but there's, there's a certain magic to it where it, it it inhabits that ephemeral space of being of having to be in a certain place at a certain time, and you know historically we just see some black and white pictures that memorialise um, a, a certain kind of uh, a certain kind of moment, and we think, oh, I would, you know, I, oh, I wish I'd got to that, or oh, that looks good, or, or, or that looks terrifying, um, you know, I'm glad I missed that. Um, but there is a kind of a sense of the the. Uh, I suppose the power it is the power of now, the power of something really happening in the in the moment, yeah. and that being a transformative engagement that changes you. It is that paradigm shifting uh, a, a kind of experience, which and you can get it with art. I mean, like like this is the thing with, with art. When you look at art, it, it's it, quite often you might find yourself going like, wow. But when I go wow, when I see an artwork and I go wow, I quite often like a little bit later on, maybe tomorrow or a week later, I might go, hmm. Um, what I quite like to do is go, hmm, when I first see it. And so I get engaged, I get kind of hooked into it, and maybe like, like later on, I, I go, oh wow, when I'm just in my own space. And I think that's the thing. And I, it comes back to that resonance thing, I think. Uh, I think what's interesting about the question as well is that you can't, when you're in that moment, you can't bottle it. You know, you mm. might, I sometimes have gone to a great performance and gone, oh, I wish I could have frozen time, or I wish I could have bottled it. And then, yeah. so you think, like, imagine if you could, like, you know, put performance art into a can, you know. The, I think what yeah, it, it, it probably asks is about the actual performance of filling the can. Exactly. That, has that been documented? Did oh, you exactly, put it directly exactly. into the cans, or did it go into a, a bottle first? It went into a bottle first. I, if I peed straight into a can, and then put a lid on it, and that was a big mistake. Um, because it, it, suddenly the temperature between the inside and the outside um, was different. <laughs> people, there's people here laughing and saying, shut <laughs> um, But anyway. Interesting. Um, but also, do you have a, I mean, do you have a cane factory now? Um, yeah, and it, it's interesting because, well, I turned part of my studio into a canning factory. And my shoe is actually, as it happens, in Canning Town. <laughs> I mean, that, you, you could, yeah. that's too short of you. You can't really it on I, 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 Well, yeah. it is in Canning Town. That, that's, that, that's how it happens. So I'm not making that up. That, that's a real place. It really but is. is there I mean, there really ought to be a live feed of you filling them. But then is there, should there be, though? Because that's <laughs> that part of the power of the art that we'll never know. Because if I, so if I buy this, yes. which I have, yes. the, but as soon as I, if I enter, was to open it, I've ruined the artwork. 
you know, I, I, it's got to come with a, whatever these NFT things are, a digital file that you yeah. actually pin in it, so each one had its own... Um, yeah, you know, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's I, a great power, though. We I, saw it. I think, exactly, I think that there, there's, a, there's a point like where you're, you're kind of giving everybody the answers, or some, not, not the answers, but you're, in a way, I think you're watering down <laughs> the, the, in a way, the, the perfection and closeness of the can, like the question, like, is this what it says it is? And also, after, you know, like, almost like when you're asking the question, is this what it says it is, you, you've also got a big problem, because, like, what's an artist? Why is it, you know, why is it an artist? What's an artist? Why is it, why is it artist piss any different from any other, any other kind of? Which is the, al- the idea of the alchemy. Like Have you seen the, um, the piss I've got, which comes from a, which I got from a practicing service magician? Uh, yes. He thought for scrying. Yes, yes. Because yes, that, 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 that piss, if it, if it, it's interesting in, that, in the sort of history of people using it for magical purposes. Sometimes you you would need to you take your own piss to the service magician and, and they look in it and they can see things. Or sometimes it's the piss that's used by the service magician. Or in other times, it's particularly powerful. Particularly if you look at historical accounts that people will say, you know, like in their 16th century accounts of of cunning men or you know, using saying they, the jar of piss they had was actually Merlin's piss. Yeah. Uh, Obviously, gave them some power. Right. No, I think I think that is quite interesting. The idea of, of telling the future, mm-hmm. um, or kind of looking the, the magic of, of of looking at this to determine something. I mean, it. On that front, have you got this book, the, the Piss Prophet? No, I no. haven't. Yeah, this is a which is a facsimile of a um, was a 16th century uh, medical book. Um, by Thomas Bryan, because um, a lot of 16th century medicine involved examining piss. Brilliant. I mean, I, I did. I did recently buy a book by a, uh, a photographer called Ricky Adam, who is called M1, and he travelled down the M1 and he went into service stations, and in the bushes he found uh, plastic bottles which were full of um, uh, full of urine, and. Um, and he took them back to his studio and photographed them like very kind of perfectly. And th- this is quite an interesting um, set of prints. <laughs> Actually, I'll just read you this because it is quite quite interesting. Um, oh, inspection of the urine uroscopy enjoyed great favour in diagnosis and treatment in Elizabethan England. And Brian was ridiculing the reputation of the peace prophets who made a specious show of falsely assumed knowledge and of perpetu- uh, perpetuated fallacies which clouded judgment. Uh, this was distributed by a medical company that was facsimile in the, <laughs> together with samples of their urinary tract antibacterial APC. But we should probably go back to the questions. John uh, Adderall wants to know where you think we should store the cannabis. Oh, oh I think. Mantelpiece. Yeah, just on the mantelpiece or, yeah, I mean, where, wherever. I mean, I really put it in the fridge. Well, I don't, think you, I don't think you want to put it in the fridge particularly. I mean, you could do, but it, I mean, I, it, I it's one you, to be enough, you don't really want, really want a six pack. You don't. You can get a six pack. That's possible. <laughs> it's in the window. Um, it's in the window. Yeah. Um, it, it's uh, no. I think you just put it. I think you just, don't go crazy, but um, just put it somewhere. Not. You don't want to put it in direct sunlight. Um, but can I have a six pack for my with my New Zealand window, please? I'll, I'll, I'll. Yeah, we'll talk about that afterwards. <laughs> There's a question there about uh, why did you make the bronze edition? Oh, okay. Um, oh, silver, yes. So basically someone's asking, why did I make a bronze one? Why, why did, did I think about making a silver one? I, I do, I think I do actually quite, I, I have been thinking I would quite like to make a silver one. Um, the bronze one, uh, it, it just, I've been making and got quite well known for making bronze sculptures. Yeah. And painting them to look like what they were, and it just adds another layer. It just came. It just yeah. kind of get, and, and in actual fact, at the foundry, they they overproduce the cans, and now I'm going to do a series of like two piss cans on a little kind of plate, which is going to take you back to Jasper Johns's oh, yes. two beer yeah. cans, yeah. Um, the Valentine's beer cans, which I have sort of worked with before as well with special brews, craft. Um, so, 
Where are we you now? You worry about the environmental impact because I've been trying to make bronzes and then you start doing it, you're looking at it and the, the amount of pollution that yeah. making bronze. No, I, I think that's I think not that's, very good, is it? No, I think that's right. I, I do. I am. I am wrestling and trying and working very hard on how to kind of um, deal with the bronze work. Um, I mean, even if you even if you light the furnace with you know with um, solar pack, you know, with uh, uh, energy from the re re renewables. I mean, renewables are not. I mean, they're not. They are the fact that no, replaceable. The energy like, still takes more energy than making a bronze. So I didn't really. It does it. Yeah. 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 Really. Because yeah. that's one of the things that. Because I don't. I just don't really understand it. But because it. I doubt that. I mean, because I mean, it's, 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 it's a bit of a. Uh, you know, because there are bronzes that are, are this size, aren't there? Yeah. That yeah. you can make at home, and maybe that doesn't use very much. And then there are bronzes that are presumably the same as NFTs. Is an NFT that someone made? I don't really what? know anything. Well, no, I think, can imagine you probably make one on your iPhone in two minutes, you can, you or you can get a studio of a hundred people to spend six months to make one. No, no I think I think that they, I think that the, the is sustaining the. I mean, sorry, everyone that knows more about this than me, but it feels that it's, it feels that it's it's about sustaining the 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 contract. Yeah. Basically, an NFT is in effect a digital contract, and the sustaining of that contract. Um, Basically, needs it needs to be stored in a blockchain process, and in order to do that, it actually like what it is is like is they call it proof of proof of work, mm -hmm. and that work equivocates to like an amount of yeah. electricity it's very, necessary it's very to, to sustain we, it. We think of the digital world as being impermanent, but the NFT is trying to be permanent. And that's the it's the permanence which is the costly thing for this. And they're permanent, and they're all they're permanent by being by being coexisting into in a network. Yeah, exactly. So they're simultaneously kind of which coexisting is, which across is a, which the is network. Thing, we like to think of artwork as being permanent, and we don't want to destroy artwork because we feel like every artwork made, and published, existed, created, signed should have a natural permanence, should outlive its artist. And I think yeah, which is why you can't open. But them. I also think that's. Oh, but I also think that's really interesting. And comes back round to the idea of collecting the uncollectible. Mm. And one of the things I've been thinking about is this idea of ownership and collecting ownership. So, so one of the problems, ownership is almost, again, like a massive pro problem that we have currently. We've got, we've got the problem of individuality um, and we've got the problem of commerciality and consumerism. And when you, combine cons when you combine consumerism with commerciality, you get this system of ownership. Mm -hmm. and, and in a way, one of the things with art is, is like, we all, want, we, we, we all own it. We, we need to find a way of everybody owning it. As We're all do, done. As you can do with this. Yeah. And <laughs> on that note, on that lovely note, I want to say thank you so much, Kate. Thank you so, so much, Victor. Thank you. Um, thank you for making it. It's really, it really cool. Um, and, uh, thank you very much. Good. Well done. That piece of me time. <laughs> Great. I'm paying your away today, but you can take yours away. Yeah, exactly. <laughs>